Thank you. It's so good to be here. I love CS100. I'm so glad it's back. Kudos to Dave and Christy and everybody who put this on. Great event. I think this is actually my fourth time speaking at this event. So this is my favorite of all the customer success events. That's why I keep coming back. So what am I going to do today? I'm actually going to tell you what I'm going to do right at the front. I have one purpose today, and that is to make your life simpler. Because the thing is, I don't know if you've noticed this, but with customer success, as things have gone on, more layers get added on and more stuff that you hear that you're supposed to do. And I think we've long since passed the point where it's way beyond what we can do. I, don't, I really don't think that, that most of the customer success reps or teams that I work with have a reasonable chance of doing more than a fraction of what is assumed they're doing. And we are all resource constrained. So I think the solution to our problems is to simplify. We, I, my goal is to remove stuff. And the way I'm going to do that, actually, is mostly with data. So I brought a bunch of data. We have some very interesting research. We have hundreds of thousands of data points in our customer retention data set. And we've done hundreds of different analyses. And there's some very interesting results, some of which I think give us a chance to rethink a little bit, rethink our, our perspectives and, and, and center ourselves back to what really matters. Okay, so the way I'm gonna start though is with a bit of a history lesson. We're gonna talk about the history of business strategy. Bear with me. The, this is an interesting set of ideas. Uh, business strategy as a concept isn't that old. It's like 50, 60 years old. And it, coming out of the Second World War, it, it was sort of developed as an, uh, as an analog to military strategy. And sure enough, that's exactly how they thought about things. There's this sense of the best product wins, right? In head-to-head -head battles, best product, best features, lowest price, very transactional. Everything was, was defined as a kind of a rivalry, right? It was you versus your competitors or suppliers. I don't know if you've ever heard of Porter's Five Forces, but that's more or less the way the framework was built. And, and it's a war metaphor. Business strategy as war. Well, I, I think over time it became obvious this doesn't include everything that's really going on, right? It's very transactional. And, it, you know, even characterized your relationship with your customers as a kind of rivalry. Who had the buying power? Who had the selling power? Well, it wasn't long. I mean, it was actually quite a long time. But eventually people noticed there were things that really mattered that are not covered in the model. Namely, and in particular, the experience, right? It's not covered at all in there. The best product doesn't always win. There's this, this whole dimension of the experience. Okay, so over the last, what, 15 years or something like that, this became the new thing. And in, in, in a sense, it kind of reframed how we think about business, which is very relevant to what we do because it's, it sets the groundwork for how we think about what it is we are for, what we do with our customers, right? And in this case, the framing is we make them satisfied, right? Because we have this underlying theory that is the, the worldview of business pretty much everywhere, which is that satisfied customers stay and unsatisfied customers leave. And this is, in a sense, the old model just kind of got discarded. It, 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 we've, we've doubled and tripled down on this, this customer experience thing. Okay, so how has that worked out? Well, I said I had data. This is really interesting <laughs> because actually not so great. So uh, you all know what NPS is, and NPS, um, Net Promoter Score, was a, was a real boon for us because what it meant was that we could compare customer satisfaction across lots of different companies, even lots of different industries. And what you'd expect is something like this, right? Longer customer lives associated with a higher score, low scores, low life, right? We just know this is true. In fact, I think this is mostly why no one's ever tested it. So why did I test it? Well, because I had an experience you might have had. Have you ever had a customer leave and on the way out say, what a great experience it's been? Have you ever had the opposite experience where they leave, where, where, I'm sorry, where they're unhappy and they complain endlessly and yet they keep renewing? What gives? What's that about? But I had this experience a lot and it looks like you have too. So I wanted to test it. Here's what the data actually shows. 
This is a large data set, 133,000 data points, very fresh too. There's literally no statistical relationship between customer satisfaction and customer retention. None whatsoever. I'm not the only one to test this, but ours is by far the biggest study and we keep updating it. What is going on? How do you explain that? I mean, we test all sorts of things. We've tested dozens of different factors. We have an incredibly interesting data set. This never correlates. It doesn't matter whether you use NPS or a different satisfaction score. Every time we test it, we get the same result. And what this result says, let's be very specific, it doesn't say customer experience isn't everything. This says it isn't anything, at least in terms of customer loyalty and retention. And that's really interesting. Okay, here's another one. If you divide customers into two groups, customers who've had negative experiences and customers who've only had positive experiences, right? And you think in terms of the way we drive loyalty is to figure out what's going on with the customers who have negative experiences because those are precursors to churn, right? So you'd expect something like this, right? Negative experiences are associated with shorter lifespans, but this is what we actually see in the data. Customers with negative experiences actually stay on average more than two times as long as customers who've only had positive experiences. What is going on? Ideas? What, how do we explain this? Are you yes, I'm asking. We got a hand. <laughs> exactly. It, what you're saying is the negative experiences don't make you stay longer. They're an artifact of something that does make you stay longer, which is trying hard. <laughs> so that explains the, hey, it was a great experience, see you later. They never really tried very hard. They weren't engaged. That's a really interesting finding because what it points to is there is something else that's not experience, that's not satisfaction, that is going on here. Here's the last one. Um, I'm going to share today. We also, of course, because we can track satisfaction, we can track retention across a very large data set. Here's the trend we've seen over the last few years. Satisfaction has been continually going up, which we shouldn't be surprised about because think of the investments that have been made, the billions of dollars that have been spent making experiences better. And by the way, customer experience is a real thing. We know for sure because we can test it consistently, we can invest in it, and we can consistently improve it. That means it's a real thing. I'm not saying it's not a real thing. It's just not related to retention. Right? So something else is going on here. Sadly, same period, we've seen churn get worse and worse and worse for so many companies. Okay, so that's the framing that I think underlies what's going on here, right? I had this experience with a, with a customer. It, it was Apple. But the worst customer, honestly, that I've ever had that I don't know that you could ever have, maybe, Terrible, always unhappy, always complaining, frustrated. And at some point, uh, I spent a lot of time over there. I was in Silicon Valley at the time. And I kind of got frustrated. I said, look, if you hate us so much, why don't you just cancel? And the guy looked at me confused a little bit, and he said, why would we cancel when you make us so much money? And my first reaction was to feel ashamed, because why did I ever think it was about anything else? Where did we get this idea that we exist to create an affective, emotional experience? Think how hard it is. I can make myself happy. I'm supposed to make hundreds of customers happy at scale, consistently, systematically. That's overwhelming, and I think it's very discouraging. The good news is, it isn't the case. Now, am I saying we shouldn't make our customers satisfied? Of course we should, and shame on us if we don't. I'm saying it just won't make them stay longer. The two different things. Okay, so what is it? Well, it's results. It turns out we've tested all sorts of things. Dozens of factors. By far the most predictive factor in the data consistently over and over and over again is whether the customer achieved measurable results. The amount of results didn't matter nearly as much as whether they achieved any and they were measurable. That turned out to be extremely important. This is by far the most predictive thing we've ever seen in the data over and over again. Customers who achieve measurables stay on average six times longer than customers who don't. That explains the unhappy customer, right? And it also explains those happy customers that seem to not 
have a compelling reason to stay. All right. So I think there's still something missing from our idea of business strategy. I think there's an endpoint here, and I think it looks something like this. Fundamentally, long-term customers stay to get results. I call that the first law of customer retention. And you can see how we've shifted from an era where everything was seen as a transaction to where it was started to be viewed in terms of a longer-term relationship. And now we understand, I think, the nature of that relationship, which is we exist to make our customers go fast. And once we do that, they want to go faster. And you can't get off that hamster wheel. That is actually the thing we bought a ticket to. Companies that do that have phenomenally high retention. Okay, so that's my first contribution to the simplification of our lives. Part of the problem is that we think it's a whole bunch of things. It isn't a whole bunch of things. I promise you, we've tested everything. It's this thing. Are there other reasons customers turn? Of course, they go out of business, all sorts of things happen. But none of those are statistically significant in the sense that they cause the majority of churn. You solve this, and we've seen it over and over and over again, your churn becomes no longer a problem. Zero churn isn't a serious idea. That's not what we're going for. We need churn to be so small it's irrelevant to our growth, right? That it's not affecting us. This is how you solve that. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing. From this, I've derived three laws of customer retention that I think are very useful, they're very functional, they're very practical. The first one, customers stay to get results. Not even just because they got results, but to keep getting results, right? So you know how you're having a bad renewal call when it sounds something like this, hey, we did really great this year, do you want to renew? That's a bad renewal call. Here's a good renewal call. That was awesome. I can't wait to get started on the phase two we've just talked about and that's going to take you to the next level. I didn't even ask them if they want to renew. It should be a given, because we've laid out a pathway. I think Donna really nailed this. Terrific concept, powerful concept. Okay, but why do customers get results then? What, what happens? The way I like to say it is, your technology doesn't produce results. The customer's behavior change produces results, and the technology makes it possible. What that means is, we give the same product to everybody, we give the same services to everybody, why do they all get such wildly different results? And the answer is because they're doing something differently. And we know what it is, but we sort of feel like it's kind of not our business. No, it's our business if we want to keep them for life. So what are we going to do? We have to think about what it is they're doing differently. How, do we, how can I predict which behaviors will lead to success and not? Well, the good news is we have this huge sample. We've seen hundreds of customers fail and succeed. We should know the end. We can be able to tell what are the behaviors that drive results and what are those that are relevant, or if you miss, will cause you to fail. Well, that's this essence. It's the customer's behavior change. That's what's at the center. And then there's one more layer, because realizing that wasn't enough, I still had to figure out, how do I get customers to change their behavior? Why is it that some do and others don't? And fundamentally, the customers who change their behavior know why and how to change. It isn't, uh, you can't assume they came knowing that. Now, some customers do. They show up and they know exactly what they're doing. And they kill it, we love it. We even learn from them, right? But most don't. Most customers arrive and they don't know what to do. Why else would they be engaging with us anyway? Why did we think they were here? Because they've done it 90 times and they just want to do it one more time? Most of them have never done it and we're the experts. They are hoping not just to get technology, but to get the expertise that we've gleaned from doing this hundreds of times or thousands. So, how to change. Do they know exactly what to do, in what order? First, second, third, clearly. We don't take that seriously enough. We focus on training on the software. We need to be training on, here's the first thing you need to do. Well, what if they're one of the customers that already knows? <laughs> uh, fine, they're not going to be offended, but they're a small group. Most people don't know. So how to change, and they even don't even know why. How many customers do you think you could go to on the first day in a kickoff call, and they could clearly articulate exactly what benefit they expect to get. If you ask them, and you do, by the way, in your kickoff call, hey, what, what are you hoping to achieve, right? Well, they say, well, I want to install this thing. That's not an achievement, that's a task, right? What's the benefit? How will, we know, how will you know you've won? It can take a few iterations. We call those the five whys, right? You can't ask five why more than five times without getting to the essence of it. 
And the essence is, what's the result? How will it be measured? Now I've got them in a position, not only where we can know if we've won, but I have the proper alignment and motivation to convince them to change, because guess what? They won't. So I need to be able to come back and say, remember this thing that was important to you, that was a key business outcome? I still want to achieve it. Why aren't you? What's going on? Well, we didn't do that one thing you told us to do because it was hard. Okay, great. Let's get recentered on that. I'm here. Let's make it happen. Because if they don't change, they're not going to win. Okay, that's the value of the three laws. There's a lot more about this that I'd love to talk about, but there's more I want to do in terms of simplifying your life. So we're going to move on. Okay. Here's another problem. The metrics we use that we operate to are actually a problem. They're um, problematic. Churn rates in particular are a real problem because they actually are terrible metrics that tell us nothing that we need to know to solve churn. So first of all, they're distorted. And one of the reasons they're distorted is churn is delayed, right? There's a, some lag of time between you when a customer buys and when they churn, if they're going to churn. That lag creates a really big problem because churn rate is a numerator, the churn, over a denominator, the total customers, right? And so something like this can happen where you have an increase in sales, but the matching increase in churn doesn't show up for a while. Now this doesn't say that the churn went up. This is just the churn we get if our, rates, if our real rate's constant, well, but what happens? So the problem is, when we hit that first increase, the denominator gets bigger, and so the churn rate goes down. Suddenly it looks like churn's gotten better, but it hasn't. Then, when you get to the churn finally arrives, it looks like churn has spiked out of control. This is when people call me, and they're like, oh my gosh, churn's out of control. Maybe. But now imagine these fluctuations happening all the time, which is what happens. Now you know why your churn rate goes like that. If you try to drive to churn rate, you'll fail. That you cannot navigate to churn rate. It's a disaster. And it wouldn't matter anyway because it's meaningless. Even if I knew for sure that this was your real churn rate, 15% or something like that, what does it tell me about what's causing your churn and what to do about it? Nothing. And part of the reason is that it implies something which isn't true, which is that churn's kind of linear. That like, I mean, it doesn't say this exactly, but I don't know what the behavior is. I just know over a period of time we lost X percent of customers. So I think of it this way. The best way to think about this is in terms of like a cohort analysis where you take the group of customers that all started together and watch how they turn out. A churn rate kind of implies this, but it doesn't really mean this. Here's a bunch of curves that all have the same average churn rate as that flat line. And these are really different. And in fact, they each tell a different story. They tell you a lot about what's happening with your churn. So uh, that shape is the story. So we've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. I don't know if you've ever seen this quote, right? Never cross a river that's an average of four feet deep. The average tells you nothing. You'll drown. So we need a, a better way of thinking about it. And I would suggest the, the most important place to start is to look at cohorts. And it turns out, although there are maybe infinite number of different shapes you could see, we've done it hundreds and hundreds of times on hundreds of thousands of data points, and there are actually only ever three that we see in churn. In real life, we only ever see three patterns, and it's incredible how much they tell you about what's going on. So I'm gonna show you. When this slide is built, Almost everything I know about churn is going to be on there. So let's start with the first kind of churn we see. We call it decelerating churn. This is where you lose more customers right at the beginning and then less and less over time. This is the most common kind of churn. So look familiar? Okay. Here's another alternative. You don't lose customers for a while until they all start leaving all at once. We call that accelerating churn. And then there is a third one, which where they just drip, drip, drip out forever. They're just constantly leaving you. This is all we ever see. That's really interesting because the story's there. Let's do the story. What does it mean when you lose customers mostly early and less and less over time? What, the reason customers churn early is, can't be the same as the reason they churn late. So what's the reason early? Failure to launch. What? Failure to launch? Bad fit. What? Bad fit. Bad fit. 
Those are the, and failure to launch, we know what that is. We've just had a whole talk about this. You don't ever get to first results. And I'm saying that that's about fundamentally about changing customer behavior. Okay, so the way to think about this, let's just go through it, is when does most of the churn happen, right? It happens early, forever, or late. Now, which of these curves would you most like to have? You don't get to have no churn. Which one is the best churn on this sheet? Shout it out. Constant. Say again. Constant. Okay, why? Okay. Any other guesses, or is that the is that the decelerating? Why? Okay, the simple way to know is just finish the curves. We know we don't like accelerating. That one crashes into the x-axis pretty soon. That's a disaster. And actually, constant churn's not much better because it's going to hit the x-axis too. You're going to lose them all. The cool thing about decelerating is, yes, it's brutal at first, but you have forever customers. That thing flattens out. And that's actually the economics of the business we're in. Okay? So, that's the answer. Now, let me just tell you, knowing which of these you have will solve so many of the problems in your business because you don't have all three kinds. We just see these three patterns. This is all we see. And they each have a different explanation. You don't have to operate on every possible reason for churn because you don't have them all. You have one of these three patterns. Trust me, we've done this over and over again. In fact, I'm going to do it for you. So what is the primary drivers early? Bad fit and failure to get customers to change enough to get a measurable first result, okay? What about in the middle? Problem with this one, this one's really insidious because it just means that they never get results that are important enough to stay. They get results, but they're just not compelling and they don't keep coming in. That one's really hard to solve. And this one, of course, is death, right? This one's bad. You don't want this one because it means, well, it could mean two things. It could just mean your product doesn't produce any value, but more likely, most commonly, what this is driven by is a temporary value. So a customer uh, gets a bunch of value, they just don't need it anymore. That's, that's a tough one to, to, to address. Okay, take your picture now. This is more or less everything we need that we know about churn, honestly. And it's incredibly powerful, because once you know what type you have, you have a simple map to the things you should focus on. Not everything, not 75 things. It's really just these things, and we do it over and over again. Let me show you some real examples. Here's a real one of our clients that has accelerating churn. We looked into it, we studied their customers. Sure enough, temporary value. They all love it. They get tremendous value out of it, and then they don't need it anymore. So they leave. They're like, thank you very much. So what's the answer? What do we do? What's the, the prescription? We've got to figure out how to make the value more durable, longer lasting, and expand into more possible ways of improving that value. If they focus on that, they thought they don't have an onboarding or a fit problem. They don't need to waste their time on that. I hope I'm being clear. This is the story. It's really fascinating. Here's another one. This is a customer who has constant churn. Now, you'll notice the stair step look of this. That means they have contracts, right? People can't leave till the end of the year. So, but if you draw a line that connects all those, the bottom, it's a constant churn. Okay, so we looked into this one. What was going on? Study the customers. Sure enough, it was of some value, but it wasn't like really important to their business. Push comes to shove, it's the thing that goes. And it wasn't compelling enough also to involve them in really intense concerted behavior change either. So there's just this drip, 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 drip. What's the solution? Tighten the focus of the product and the services and the success support around the real business value that we do see and strengthen that, focus around that. Maybe even let go of some of the customer segments who weren't really able to turn it into real money, into real value. And actually, it did work. They, they produced a lot of improvement in their churn. Okay, this one is the most common, okay? So here's an example of a pretty classic looking curve, obviously monthly uh, contract, so you don't, have, you don't have stair steps. So what's going on here? Very steep initial drop off. First month, 25% of the customers leave. 
This is extreme, but it's not that rare. <laughs> and most companies have some version of, of this. Okay, so this is where that churn rate problem gets us, because if I describe this as a rate, you really don't understand what's going on here, and there's a very clear story, right? Um, the other thing is, well, then how will we measure it? What is a good way to measure it? Well, a few years ago, I discovered that chemists had solved this problem with radioactive decay. I didn't pay attention. I had to rediscover it on, on Wikipedia. But what's fascinating is they have exactly the same shape curves, and they know you can't use a decay rate. You have to use what they, what they use is half-life. You may remember this. How long does it take to lose half the cohort? So here we go. In this case, it was like six months. Okay? It was half the cohort, really fast. But then it slows down quite a bit, actually. So interesting, right? Here's the crazy thing. My whole argument is that once you know what kind of churn you have, you can focus just on the things that drive that churn. Limited resources, things are too complex, probably half of what we do has no leverage and we just don't know what it is. You will know when you find out what kind of churn you have and then focus on the two things. So I said bad fit, turns out, Almost all of that initial drop was bad fit customers. This product required you to be integrated with a certain other business system. Surprisingly large number of their customers came in and didn't even have that other business system. We can solve for that, okay? Um, and then first value. Get them to making their first dollar that they can attribute in the system. And the magic number is one dollar. Because in the long run, you have to produce significant value. But the reason customers leave early is because they never got any or didn't measure it. Okay, so here's the thing about nonlinear math. A little nerdy, bear with me. If I cut just the early churn, just the first 90 days in half, what will that do to the average lifespan of customers? If it was linear, it would double the average lifespan, right? What does it do in nonlinear math, anyone know? It's a multiplier effect. You can see that the biggest impact you can have on churn here is wherever the slope is the steepest. So if we measure this as a half-life, right, there's the half-life of where we are. If I cut just early churn, I never touch any other churn. I never do anything about it. It improves our half-life by almost four times. That's the power of understanding the real story, the nonlinear story of the way churn really works. So it's really incredible, very fascinating, and we do this all the time. You can have a tremendous impact on your overall churn rates, but here's the other thing that's really interesting about this. You can also see the impact you're having. So one of the things that's frustrated me for years was that we do something, some big program, some intervention, everybody you know, pulls together and we do this incredible thing, and we don't know. Churn went down a little bit, but then the next month it went up again. We, just, like, we don't know, churn rates are part of the problem. Right? So what do we do? We do this with cohorts. We make a big change. We fix our bad fit problem or we, we try to improve time to first value, whatever, behavior change. Does the next cohort do better? And this is the beauty of it. I can draw that next line and say, is it higher? Are we doing better? It's really powerful because I think that's the last problem with the way we measure churn and retention, is that it not only doesn't teach us what's going on, but it doesn't allow us to know what, what works and what doesn't work, the impact we're having, right? Okay, so that's a powerful thing. So here's my summary of three ways to simplify our lives. First, understand it's all about results. Yes, we satisfy our customers because we're good people, and that's the right thing to do. But we also have to produce results, or we're not going to have long-term customers. Second, those three laws simplify where our focus should be. It's not 100 different things. It really does come down to customer behavior change. And it's not that hard once you know what kind of churn you have. So how do you find out what kind of churn you have? It's actually not super complicated, but I have decided I'm just going to do it for you. If you're here, contact me through one of these methods, send me information, we'll set up a meeting, we'll get your data, and I'll show you. We'll draw it for you. And um, normally, we wouldn't do this, but this is, like I said, I'm just so excited that this event is back and that we're here together in this place. 
Anyway, I want to do it for you. So please reach out to me. We'll tell you what kind of churn you have, and let's get your life simplified and get your impact improved. Thanks.